and Sorry. then I'll switch to English. So uh, thanks, uh, Jean-Marc, for the nice introduction, for the general, Jean-Bernard, for the generous introduction. And so today I'm going to talk about joint work with uh, my former uh, postdoc, Lene Ekshiza, on the convergence uh, of algorithms for neural networks. So hopefully at the end of the talk, everything will be, uh, will be well defined. So um, I'm going to consider uh, uh, machine learning. So I give examples like in a, in a moment, but the goal of machine learning is you being given uh, some observations like X, I, Y, I. So X, I can be an image. Y, I can be a label on that image and you receive N observations. And the goal is give me a new X. So here a new image and uh, try to predict the new Y. Okay, so it's an input output problem. And this prediction is being parameterized by some uh, function H, okay, which takes as inputs uh, your input X, also a parameter vector, and the parameter vector will be of dimension D, and D will be uh, typically uh, very large. So to make things concrete, so there are two main classes of models that people consider in practice, pure linear models, where you prediction function is linear in theta, and, uh, and this is used a lot, for example, in advertising, where phi of x, your feature vector is simply uh, for each of clients of search engines or any like internet company, you have a one if you, if you went to see a website or zero otherwise. And so you get a big long vector of zeros and ones, and from that they're going to predict if they want to show you an ad or not. Okay, so what makes the problem Difficult is that both n and d are very large. So in this talk, n will always be the number of observations, so very large, and d will be the size of the parameter vector, uh, also uh, quite large. But uh, more and more uh, for um, problems in computer vision or multimedia, uh, linear models are not sufficient anymore. And the state of the art is achieved by uh, neural networks <clears throat> which will be for this talk a, a sequence of linear models and non-linearity. So you start with X, you multiply by a linear function, okay, like in like like in a linear model, but then you take like non-linearity component-wise and you go on, okay, and with like theta two and, and up to R uh, layers. Okay, so this is what's being used in a, in a problems in computer vision, for example, where X is an input, is an image, and Y is a label on that image. So here, a cat or dog. For so the way this is done uh, uh, algorithmically is by uh, minimizing some risk. And the risk is defined by the some average over your training data of a loss. Think of the loss as being least squares, or I will show other examples like today the loss between what you want to predict, yi, and your prediction, uh, h of x psi and theta. So a classical data fitting term plus some uh, uh, regularizer. Okay. So one important note, which will not be the strong focus uh, today, but this is just a mean to an end. So you want to do well on your training data, which you observe, but what you really care about is to do well on unseen data. So you want to generalize to unseen y and x. And of course, if you don't see uh, the pair x, y, it needs, it needs to be related to your input data, to, to your training data, and you assume they come from the same distribution. Okay, so this is important to note that optimization for us is just a mean to an end. All right, so in the machine learning and optimization, uh, there has been a lot of work focusing on convex optimization problems. And those convex problems for us, they come from uh, essentially having a linear model. Okay, so if your prediction function H of X and theta is linear in theta, and your loss function is convex with respect to your second variable, and most of them are, so least squares, uh, this is convex in the, the second variable, then you get a nice convex optimization problem. And in the last like 10 to 20 years, there has been a lot of efficient algorithms that were designed uh, uh, for this and typically gradient based and I'll show examples in a minute. And the key benefit of convexity here is that uh, uh, you can analyze what's happening and give very precise quantitative uh, runtime and prediction performance guarantee. 
So give me your data, okay, with only a few statistics of the data, like the maximum norm of the features. I can tell you how, uh, how much time I need to uh, give you an answer. Okay, so this is uh, 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 very nice, and this is due to the complexity that, that makes it easier to uh, understand. So this has led to what I call the golden years of convexity in machine learning, where uh, in a series of different problems, convexity can, could be leveraged to obtain such quantitative guarantees, okay, which also are close to practice. Okay, so what we, uh, what we what the community is predicting as, a, as performance is not too far away from what you see in practice. And this was true for kernel methods, also true for sparse problems based on L1 norms, optimal transport, stochastic techniques for large-scale learning, and, uh, and many others. Okay, so this was like, and if I had uh, come to give a, a, a talk like five years ago, I would probably have talked about something, something like this. But the issue is that uh, uh, people want to know what's happening for non-convex models, okay? And in particular, uh, for deep learning, so for neural networks where uh, uh, you have like multiple layers and hence you have a nonlinear model. So first a note, this is uh, already a simplification because in practice, in particular for computer vision, uh, people are using like more complex models. They have convolutional layers, uh, which are dealing with like pseudo invariance by translation. They have pooling, so many other things that are being, are being, are being considered. And this talk, I will only consider the fully connected networks. So there are two difficulties that we need to tackle uh, here. So the first one, which I already alluded to, is this is a non-convex optimization problem. So you may have like multiple local minimum. Uh, first problem. Second problem, uh, we're going to consider neural networks with a lot of parameters. And there are two ways to have uh, for uh, having a lot of parameters, either your layers are very wide, so a lot of uh, hidden neurons, or you're very deep. So in this talk, I will not be very deep, I will just be uh, very wide. Okay, so you have lots of neurons. And typically in statistics, when the number of parameters exceeds the number of observations, you have to be careful about generalization, and this is, will be the uh, second part of the talk, how you ensure guarantees in a setup where you have lots of neurons. So, oh, I forgot to mention that if you want to ask questions during the talk, feel free to interrupt. Okay, so I cannot see the chat, but just like show either your face or your sound, and I will try to answer the question. So first uh, thing, uh, uh, optimization. Okay, so, so what can go wrong when you, when you optimize a non-convex problem to pretty much everything? Okay, here this is a very simple example in 2D, okay, uh, of like a function and I plot the level sets. So I have like a global minimum, a few local minima, which are not global, I have a global maximum, I have some saddle points there, there, and there. And so everything can, can happen and things will depend on where you initialize. So the first series of work uh, on non-convex optimization uh, has aimed at being local. So if I can't ensure that I'm going to get to the global optimum over there, can I make sure that I get at least to one of those four, uh, one of those four uh, points, local minima? And uh, so there's a nice series of work uh, uh, referenced here, showing that you can, with guarantees, you can attain some stationary point, or more precisely, with some guarantees, you can obtain a low, a low gradient, a low norm of the gradient. Okay, so this is nice. It shows that locally it will be good. So if you are really good, you can, you can make sure you obtain a local minimum and not a stationary point, okay, by adding some noise typically. But this is only local. Our goal is to go global. So first a piece of bad news is that it's not possible to go global unless uh, you're willing to be exponential in dimension. And the proof is a really a zero line proof. This is a function like this. Okay, so if, if it is, if you want to minimize a function which is like very flat, except at some region where it's a bit smaller, with local techniques, you will never be able to uh, get you never be able to get the uh, uh, global optimum unless you're lucky and see this by chance. 
And in high dimension, the volume of that region gets uh, shrinks exponentially in dimension. So you cannot uh, really hope to do this in high dimensions. Keep in mind that for us, uh, D, the number of parameters could be millions or billions. And then you would tell me, but okay, this is a, this is a hard function to optimize, but who uh, really cares about optimizing this one? Okay, let's say I care about neural networks. So let's focus on neural networks. So, so also like an interesting series of works trying to look at special cases to make uh, life easier. So the first uh, nice paper by Chorman's and colleague is looking at random models. Okay, so if you have a random uh, neural network, uh, what can you say about it? And essentially they show that uh, for those like random function models, you can all the local minimum are in fact like close to the global optimum. So this is something which is uh, good news. If you can, ex if you're good locally, you're essentially good globally. The issue with this is, is really a random model, which is like too, too independent from the data. So it's not super relevant directly for, uh, for practice. Second line of work by uh, Sultanol Kotabi and colleagues showing that for some sub problems uh, like potentially quadratic activation functions, like the sigma being quadratic, then you can avoid local, previous local minima. So all of them are global. Again, very interesting, but this is limited to uh, activation functions, which are quadratic, which are not what well, the ones that people use in practice. So let's try to see how we can uh, uh, look at it. And so I'm going to specialize even more to a single hidden layer. Okay, so this will be my neural network. So this is the first uh, non-linear model, okay, in the series of uh, neural networks. Okay, I have, I start from my X, so here in dimension six, I apply some uh, linear transforms to theta one. So theta one is a matrix, often called the input weights. I get to neurons, so here are four neurons. So theta one is of size D by M. And given those like four hidden neurons, I combine them to get the output uh, H. So theta two is the output weight, which is a vector of size M. Okay, so this is the um, notations. So I'm going so the, I'm going to divide by M for reasons I will explain later. But dividing by M or not is simply the same by replacing theta two by theta two over uh, theta two times M. And so uh, this is so in math the the, the uh, equation. So I take my input, multiply by the vector, uh, one column of theta one to get the hidden neuron number j, and I combine whole hidden neurons to get the predictor function. For the only uh, property I'm going to leverage uh, for the next few uh, uh, minutes is that my prediction function h here is a sum of terms, okay, or an average of terms, and each of those terms uh, have its own parameter, a unique parameter. Okay, so I have a sum from j equal to one to m of a function of wj, and wj being my parameters. And here, in the context of neural networks, this will be uh, uh, the input weight associated with neuron j and the corresponding output weight. So here, if I take this is for j equals one, being that neuron, I have those weights, incoming weights, and this output weight. Okay, so this is here. We really need that the parameterizations here are independent. So this does not allow us to go beyond a single hidden layer. Why? Because if you start to have more than two hidden layers, then uh, there will be sharing of parameters in the first layers. And this condition of independent parameterization uh, will not be satisfied. So whatever I said does not apply uh, to more than a single hidden layer. All right, so then this is our prediction function, an average of, of, of uh, functions. And the goal is to minimize the risk, okay? So the expected risk either on your training data, so pure XY could be the empirical, empirical distribution or on the test data, I do, I do both uh, this talk. And I have a loss between my label and h of x, my prediction function. And I'm going to assume that this one is um, this one is convex in h. Okay, so think of the loss being d squares so or logistic regression, okay, that I will show uh, later. But the fact that the loss is uh, the loss is uh, convex is a weak assumption. Okay, even in the deepest of the deepest networks, uh, the loss is typically convex. 
Okay, so the R is convex, and the goal is to minimize it. So of course here, parameterized as a function of, of W, the parameters, so W being theta here, uh, it's, not, it's not convex. Okay. So what is the main insight be, behind like the analysis that I'm going to propose? And the main insight is not ours, okay? It's very it's classical insight in signal processing is that when you go to M being large, okay, you're going to have an, an average of our many, uh, many WJs. So you, you can see it as the integral of your function CFW, a single neuron parameters by W times some measure. And uh, to have equality, you need that measure to be the empirical measure uh, associated with your uh, M, M neurons. And often I will use the term particles for reasons uh, you, uh, you will see like in the, in, the, in the plots later. So neurons or particles, okay, I'm going to use the, the two. And the idea is that uh, when you get over parameterization, so a lot of the acts, they can converge distribution to some measure with some density. And essentially the mean field limit, which is often the, the name in physics, okay, you get more and more particles and they have a global behavior and the global behavior, this is obtained by the density. And so I'm going to go from uh, uh, an average of, of uh, CFWJ to an integral. Okay, so now the new object will be the measure d mu. Okay, and so uh, this insight, okay, so this is <clears throat> this is like quite old and this comes from statistical signal processing. And uh, and so here what I what I have achieved is I have this made the problem linear, okay, in the sense that uh, the parameterization in WJ is non-linear because the C is non-linear. But d mu h uh, is uh, linear in d mu. So now I have a convex function r over a parameter d mu. Okay, so everything is convex. Okay, so in a sense, I have convexified our problem. So sure, it's convex, but it's now convex in the high dimensional space, in the space of measures. Okay, so at the end, uh, it's not because you have a convex problem that is easy to solve in practice. Because now the problem is infinite dimensional. I came, I went from m neurons, okay, to like a continuum of neurons. So it's hard to optimize. So first possibility is to use a, a convex optimization technique de dedicated to problems uh, uh, which are uh, constrained, okay, on the set which is a convex hull of many things. So measures, probability measures, and this is what the one over M comes into play. I have probability measures are the convex hull of all the acts. Okay, so if I know how to optimize over large convex hulls, maybe I can optimize this cost function. And it's essentially what Frank Wolf algorithms are doing. Okay, and the way they work, they work by adding neurons one by one. Okay, so I have a neuron, okay, I, have a, I have a predictor, and I have to check which neuron I should add uh, to my set of existing neurons to minimize uh, the, the risk. And this can be done. This leads to nice convergence rates. Okay, after T neurons, I'm one over T away from the optimum. But the issue here is that the task of adding a new neuron, okay, although it is simple to, uh, to formulate it, is uh, NP hard. Okay, so you replace a hard convex problem by a sequence of hard convex problems every time you need to solve one to see which neuron to add. So it's not tractable. I've worked on that like a few years ago. And even worse, it's not what people use in practice. In practice, what people do is forget about my uh, mean field limit, okay? Just take your particles, your, your parameters, your neurons, and do what is called back propagation, which is gradient descent, which is called back propagation because to compute gradient, you have to do a backward pass uh, towards the network. Okay, so this is what I'm going to follow. We want to study, if we take what people do in practice, can we say anything about it? So this leads to uh, three questions. So the first one is the, uh, what is the algorithm limit when the number of particles, excuse me, what is the algorithm limit when the number of particles go to infinity? Okay, so does it mean something to, to have the mean field limit when you do gradient descent. 
And second, the answer will be yes. Uh, second question, okay, and this subject, can you prove anything about its global convergence? And uh, the response will be yes as well. And then third question, does it, does it, predict, does it predict well? Given that I need M to go to infinity to optimize correctly. So I need to be over parameterized to, to converge, uh, to allow easy optimization. But if I make a problem uh, ill-defined or ill-conditioned in, in terms of statistics, maybe I'm not getting much. So let's look at this. Okay, so this is like the first like uh, uh, result that we uh, obtained uh, obtain with the Linaic Shiza. So just a summary of the notations and this function of the measure, which is the risk, okay, so square loss uh, of my average of predictors, okay, so each C of W is one, one single neuron uh, parameterized by W, and the way the algorithm works by minimizing the loss, okay, uh, directly on the on particle. So first, I'm going to uh, not consider gradient descent because it's uh, too hard. I'm going to look at, uh, look at an idealization of gradient descent when the step size goes to zero. Okay, so this is known to be uh, uh, equivalent to the gradient flow. So if you follow gradient steps for uh, like a step size gamma and gamma goes to zero, you can see that the discretization or the earlier method for the ordinary differential equation and uh, that's why I'm going to analyze the uh, 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 gradient flow. Okay, so this can be do uh, this can be done uh, either in the deterministic setup, okay, which is uh, classical, but there is also uh, uh, this can be done as well for stochastic gradient. So this is not uh, as 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 uh, well known. Is that if you add noise to your to your gradients, okay, and typically in machine learning. Uh, Stochastic gradient descent is the noise is obtained by sampling a single data point except of the whole data set. Okay, you get a noisy estimate, and because you select it at random, it's uh, the average of the stochastic gradient is a, is a full gradient. It's, it's efficient by design, but it adds some uh, variance to the, to the estimation. And so you can show that uh, so when the step size go to zero, okay, then SGD also will end up being close to the gradient flow. And in fact, this was uh, the first proofs in the 60s or 70s were using that, uh, that proximity to that proximity to the gradient flow. So one important aspect when you do HGD, it's not the main topic of, of, the, of the talk, but I think it's important as well, is that if you do a single pass, so if you take your observation one by one, compute a single gradient and, and, and go down, if you do a single pass, in fact, you explicitly uh, minimize uh, the or implicitly minimize the expected risk. Okay, so you, you cannot overfit if you do a single pass. Okay, uh, whereas if you do multiple passes, if you get to see points over and over again, you converge to the minimum of the empirical risk, and hence you may overfit. And I will show examples. I will talk about this more uh, at the end of the talk. All right. So, so the goal is gradient flow. So first question: What is there a limit when m goes to infinity? So here, I would just say the limit as a name, and the name is the Wasserstein gradient flow. So it's a flow on the measure of the set of probability measures. Okay, so you can define flows based on a metric on the space of measures. So the metric is not the usual like uh, Euclidean metric on the measures, not the M2 metric on measures. This is the metric obtained by uh, optimal transport. And a series of works uh, have shown that if you let the number of neurons go to infinity, then you end up trying to locally uh, uh, low, trying to minimize the function around like a small balls in Wasserstein metric. Okay, so this is if you know what Wasserstein metric is, this may say something. If not, I think it's not uh, it's not a, a, a big deal. The idea here is that on that metric, importantly, the gradient flow has some stationary points, and you may get stuck. So although the problem f of mu, f is convex in mu. In this metric, you may have a local minimum. And in fact, this is well known. It is well known because this includes uh, the finite number of neurons. So if you start a gradient flow, Wasserstein, with uh, only like a empirical measure, this is equivalent to do like the gradient flow separately on all, all neurons. And it's known that 
kind of descent for neural networks, if you have a finite number of neurons, may get stuck. Okay. So it's a dynamical system or garden flow with for which you have local you have like a local minima stationary points which are not global. So it's a hard and complex uh, uh, problem. But the question is, can you prove any form of global convergence? And this is what we did uh, the same work with the Lenaic Chizar. And here I'm going to only state some informal theorem because there will be too much, too many technical conditions. And to me, this is important to mention because all the work that, that I have that I have alluded to in the earlier part of the talk about convex problems, everything was super quantitative. Okay, so give me data that satisfy basic uh, bodiness assumption after time t, I'm going to be that close. Okay, so here it's very qualitative. And the, the theorem is if uh, you take this object when m is infinite, the mean field limit, then if uh, uh, you initialize correctly, you're going to convert to the global optimum. Okay, so again, all the precise definitions are in the, the paper. And uh, uh, this uh, comes with two ingredients. Okay, so uh, the first one is homogeneity. Okay, we need some properties about our uh, prediction functions and some initialization. So what are those? So homogeneity, you need that the psi function, so the prediction function, they have to obey some form of homogeneity. They say that it have to be homogeneous. So if you multiply the parameter by a constant, the output is multiplied by that constant times some power potentially. And this has to be uh, partially homogeneous. This is true for neural networks because you are at least homogeneous with respect to the last layer. It's also true globally if sigma is also called like rectified linear unit, so the max of yourself and zero, okay, so often called the positive part. So you are too homogeneous in that setup, but it's true like uh, in, a, in all cases. Second condition, you need uh, the measure to be, the initial measure to be well spread along all directions. Okay, so sample like a Gaussian, for example. And the good thing is this, this is what people use in practice. Okay, even for those deep networks, you always use like isotropic uh, uh, initializations. So let's look, uh, so it's only qualitative again. Okay, so I wish I could give you like a precise a number of neurons M to attain the midfield limit and the time it takes to converge, but uh, we have no clue. So just to highlight the results, so this is uh, uh, going to consider a very simple problem in 2D. Okay, so we are very far away from big data. Uh, so we're going to uh, uh, generate H. Okay, so this is uh, going to generate data from a neural network with five neurons. Okay, and because I'm using the positive part, uh, I will concatenate that with data one, okay, and plot only the directions. So essentially, a neuron is defined by a point in this 2D plane, okay, and the idea is uh, uh, in what we plot here, the small dots are the positions of neurons at the end of the garden flow. When, when, the, when the garden flow stops, you see what the neurons are. In dotted, you see what the optimal positions are. So if you converge you well to the zero uh, zero loss, okay? Then uh, uh, the red point should be aligned with the uh, dotted axis. And here I'm trying three number of neurons, okay? Uh, five here, so five, since the optimal predictor was generated with five neurons, you have enough capacity to get to zero loss, okay? And in fact, we don't, okay? So in this particular example, this is like, reproducible if you do like, sometimes you converge of course, but many times you don't converge. Okay, if you have many neurons, okay, and this is what our, our result is suggesting, if it takes the mean field limit, then you're going to uh, uh, converge the global optimum. Okay, and indeed all the neurons uh, end up like converging toward the correct values. And the surprising aspect is that uh, if you have an intermediate number of neurons, a constant times the minimum number of neurons to converge to, to be able to converge to zero, then it, it also works quite stably. Yes, this we cannot, we still cannot really uh, uh, prove why, but this is observed by also other people. Small video to show the uh, weirdness of the dynamics. So this is, uh, so you start, so you, let me start again. 
So you start like you start like around the optimum, okay, uniform around zero, and then you let the neurons go. And uh, so the dynamic is a bit is not uh, straight, okay. You do like, a lot of turns, okay, but at the end you convert to the correct set of directions. <clears throat> Up, up. Oh, maybe I can take some questions here because I'm going to, to switch topics. Uh, if there are any questions at this time? Yes, just one quick question. Um, how big is big in terms of a number of neurons in order to have this limit behavior? Is there an, a, a way to know the number of neurons that you need? No, I think this, is a, a, this, this remains an open problem. Okay, and that it's, uh, no, nope. we've tried, okay. And so clearly uh, what we show is that if the number of neurons is infinite, it's fine. But this is like of low practical relevance. We would like to know how many, but uh, no, I'm, I, I don't know. I think in most, I think in most like analysis now, I think people, start to have some ideas, but it's very, it's still very limited. Okay, thanks. Yep. All right, so let's look now at the, uh, the summary of what we have uh, uh, seen so far. So I'm minimizing some, uh, uh, some neural networks with some parameters. And when the number of neurons go to infinity, at least you can expect the gradient flow to converge to a global minimizer, okay? And what it required was some well-spread initialization like in all directions. And again, no quantitative results. And so this can be done in the two uh, setups. If you do a single pass uh, stochastic gradient, then uh, R here will be the uh, expected risk on unseen data. And this will typically uh, converge to the best predictor of the test set. But in practice, this tends to, to underfit. What people do in practice is they do multi-pass uh, SGD. Okay, so they go over the, the data like multiple times. And uh, then R, you convert to the minimum of R being the empirical risk. Okay, so you convert to the best predictor on the training data. And it may be an issue with overfitting because you may not generalize correctly. So the goal now is to study, to study this. Okay, so why is it, uh, why is it uh, uh, difficult? Because uh, uh, we are looking at the number of parameters. Okay, so if I, if I have n hidden neurons, then the number of parameters is n times d plus one. So when that number of parameters is bigger than, uh, is bigger than the number of observations, you should expect that uh, uh, there are many uh, function h, okay? for which uh, you exactly uh, get uh, uh, the label. Okay, so where h of x i is exactly y i, or if you have a different type of loss, you can have zero loss. Okay, so this is often called the interpolation regime, which can be used for optimization. But today I'm going to try to see, okay, uh, uh, what you can say about the outcome of gradient descent. So since there are many h that are, that are interpolating, whenever I optimize up to zero loss, I have obtained one of those edge functions, but which one, okay? And can I characterize which one? And can I show it does generalize well, okay? And this is often called the implicit bias of uh, stochastic gradient descent. So typically to take home message from a series of work by uh, 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 a group at Chicago, like Gunaseka, Sudri, and colleagues, is that often among all solutions, you get the one with some minimum Euclidean norm. And this, this will be the topic of the last part of the talk. So it's quite difficult to show for the square loss in general, okay? But uh, if you use a different loss, like classification, things get easier. And I'm going to present what I, what I mean uh, uh, by this. So let's look at the uh, Logistic regression, okay, which is a task of classification when yi is text value minus one on one. So this is by far the most used loss function in machine learning. Okay, so the goal is to uh, uh, predict uh, that the prediction function, which is linear here, has the same sign 
as yi. Okay, so here I'm going to go back to linear functions to give you uh, the result that people have shown, and then I'm going to extend it to the classical setup, to the uh, neural network setup. Okay, so because I'm going to consider n being very large, no, d being very large, so I should expect that uh, my, uh, the, my matrix of x's has full rank and I can uh, fully separate the data. And this is what I'm going to assume, that I know one theta for which all the predictions have the correct sign, like strictly, by just renaming theta, I can make it bigger than one, okay? And now uh, uh, you can quickly, uh, we, we will quickly see that the minimizer of that function is zero and obtained at, infi at infinity. Why? Because uh, this is a logistic function here in the green over there. And this is minimum where the, it is infinity, okay? So this means that if you want to minimize uh, this, uh, then uh, this will minimize when all of those are sent to infinity. Okay, so we know that the global minimum is zero. The global value of the minimum is zero and sent to infinity. So if you use gradient descent, you won't converge to anywhere. You have to diverge. And in fact, this is what Sudari and colleagues have shown is that gradient descent will diverge, but it will diverge to some direction Okay, uh, uh, which is called the maximum margin separator, and I will focus only on this one, and which is among the, all the uh, uh, theta that will separate the data like this, you take the one with, you take the one with minimum norm. So this is exactly the super vector machine, the separable case uh, uh, from '64 and uh, uh, quite popularized in the '90s and uh, early 2000s where you, you look for the separating hyperplane, okay, that will be, would have the maximum margin that will make that distance. So if you project the data here and the data there, the total distance here has to be as large as possible. So this is choosing among all separating hyperplane, the one which is like the most in the middle. And this is uh, uh, the minimum L2 norm. Okay, so this is a nice uh, uh, result by Sudri, okay, in the uh, uh, linear case. Okay, now the goal would be to extend this to the neural network case. Okay, so this is uh, my neural network. Again, output weights, input weights, I have my nonlinearity. And now what I'm going to talk about will be exclusively for the rectified linear unit. I will need homogeneity a lot. And I'm going to consider uh, uh, m going to infinity. Okay, so what you have from the previous uh, part of the talk is that is going to converge to global minimum, okay? So here it, it should diverge, okay? But uh, how, uh, how does it diverge? What is the norm that I'm going to implicitly uh, uh, minimize? So this is also joint work with Lena Ikshiza uh, from this year. And we're going to consider two setups, okay? Mm -hmm. One which is only optimizing over the last layer, okay? And one optimizing over the two layers, okay? And we'll see two, two different behaviors. Okay, so the, the first regime, which I call the random uh, kernel regime, I'm going to assume the input weights are random and fixed, okay, and only optimize over theta two. So why is it easy given previous work? Because this is just a linear model, okay? I've just hidden the nonlinearity, and uh, this is like, this corresponds to having some feature vector phi of x, okay? And uh, uh, like this, which is composed of each of the individual neurons, and I'm just doing linear model. Okay, so if I use a linear model, I should expect to convert to the minimum L2 norm uh, uh, for that model. In fact, this is what, uh, what you can show, okay, that for M being fixed, okay, you convert to minimum L2 norm, fine, but what does it do when M goes to infinity? Okay, this is the goal of today. And what it does is uh, converging, converging to, uh, uh, the prediction function will convert to a smooth function and the way to analyze uh, uh, the function space I'm going to uh, use is to use like kernel methods. Okay, so kernels, whenever you uh, do linear predictions with a penalty on L2 norms, you know it is known that uh, everything will depend on the dot product between the, between the features. Okay, this will characterize the function space that, that, has, that has been used. This was very fashionable like 15 years ago. And so here with that feature vector, uh, phi of x, okay, like this, 
there the kernel can be computed and you get an average okay over over all the j of one feature times the other feature this is computed, computed at x and this is computed at x prime and now i'm going to use randomness of my problem where the, the input weights are sampled randomly and id so by the law of large numbers this should convert to some expectation okay so this is a uh, classical technique uh, used by Radford Neal in the 90s and Jaime and Recht back in the 2000s. The goal being, I have a kernel, okay, like, and I'm expressing it as an expectation, and I'm using the finite m to approximate my problem. So here I do the so by the opposite, I have a finite m problem. I want to study the limit when m is large. I'm going to study uh, the problem when m is large by uh, taking limits and using the expectation. Okay, so we have a kernel, okay? So it's known that as soon as I'm learning on the kernel space, I can just, I just have to study uh, 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 the functions which are uh, uh, characterized by that kernels. Okay, and essentially, those are linear combinations of kernel, of kernel functions which are evaluated at one point. Okay, so it's called like a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, a very nice uh, book by Shulkov and Smola. And the key message here is that those are spaces of very smooth functions. Okay, so one uh, necessary condition to be an uh, archaeology is that the function is sufficiently differentiable. Okay, so you, you need to have smooth functions. In particular, a single neuron is not part of the archaeology, which is a bit like uh, counterintuitive. I'm combining many neurons, okay, but since I combine infinitely many, many of those, and uh, uh, I cannot have a single one being part of it. This will be due to this will be due to the L2 norm, which I will uh, allude to in a moment. And what is the informal theorem saying that okay, at the end, if you launch gradient descent with respect only to the second layer with random initialization, okay, so the input weights do not move because they are fixed, and the output weights are moving because you optimize about them then you, you get to this separating function you classify uh, perfectly but among all the functions that classify correctly you take the one with the minimum uh, minimum norm okay and typically those norms are penalizing derivatives so i want the smoothest functions that is uh, 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 separating my data okay so this can be made quantitative because it's convex in fact because we only optimize about the last layer and uh, one note is that this is, not what we, this is not what you would use in practice to get to get m go to infinity. The reason being that as soon as m is bigger than n, n being the number of uh, observations, you have better things to do, which I will not explain. Now let's have to see the other, when you optimize over the two, uh, the two uh, layers of neurons. For this, I have to uh, abstract a bit uh, to be a, become a bit more abstract to, uh, uh, re to redefine uh, the norm I just defined. Okay, so if you only optimize over the uh, output weights, you can show that you're going to represent f as a linear combination of neurons. Okay, this is a, uh, this is a neuron in the neurons that like linear function plus positive part. And I'm going to take an integral of those neurons. Okay, so it's like the infinite, infinite limit. But when I optimize over the last layer only, I'm going to uh, penalize the square del two norm. Okay, the two here is important. Okay, and this is a space of smooth functions. What I'm going to consider now is replacing the L2 norm, the square del two norm, by the L1 norm. Okay, so the exact same representation. I want uh, to look at functions which are linear combinations of, of potentially a continuum of neurons, okay? But now the subtle change is that I'm going to put an L1 norm, okay? And what this subtle change is allowing is to allow for a single neuron, okay? So the Dirac, so a single neuron corresponds to a measure here, the full measure, A, 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 A D tau, uh, to be a Dirac. So Dirac's, okay, are in L1, but are not in L2. Okay, so this means that here in the second case, I can have a single neuron, uh, which is in the function space, whereas here I can't have a single neuron. Okay, so this space is much larger, okay, because L1 is less than L2 norm, and that's set up. And 
most importantly, you allow for single hidden neuron, so you can combine a small number of neurons, so you can adapt to anything. And what I've shown, like in earlier work, is that, that those type of norms, you can adapt to various uh, uh, structures. For example, if your function only depends on a small number of, of variables, using those spaces, you will not be able to leverage it. Whereas here, you will be able to leverage it. Okay. So if you want more detail, you can look at the paper with Lenaik. And the result is that if you optimize over like all parameters, this is what people do in practice. Okay, so you sample randomly theta two and theta one, then you optimize. And in the context of logistic regression, okay, you go into separate the data. This is what you expect because you are over parameterized, but you go in to convert to this minimum variation norm, which has just defined. Okay, so it's a well defined uh, function space. So the key here is that, and I will not talk about it, this is uh, you get adaptivity to linear structures. So if you depend on a small number of variables, it's going to leverage it. You do actual learning of representations. So the neurons are moving. So the hidden neurons are moving. And this like in this neural network literature, typically when the neurons are moving, this is what you call representation learning. So you're going to embed your data X uh, through the M neurons. And this embedding is what's really key uh, behind the success of neural networks. So they, here there is some uh, learn embedding. All right, so let's look at some, uh, at some pictures to, uh, to make clear the message uh, in 2D. So we're going to have like on the left is a space of parameters of neurons. Okay, so you see neurons moving. So this is that will be in 2D and I will have some uh, constant term then I'm going to have three parameters for every neuron. So you will see like a bunch of neurons in 3D uh, which are moving, okay? And on the right, this will be the space of predictors, okay? So I'm going to be in 2D. So you're going to see like separate, like regions separated by my function. So again, on the, up, oh, let me stop. On the left here, on the left, so you start uh, with neurons uh, which are, uh, which are uh, sampled uniformly. Okay, uh, 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 like that of the sphere. And then they start to move, okay. And some of them are not moving because they are in the negative part of the ROLU. So they are, they are zero gradients, so they don't move, but all the rest will coalesce to a small number of points. And on the right, you see the effect on the space of prediction functions. You get to only like piecewise affine boundaries, highlighting the fact that you convert only to a small number of active neurons. Okay. So this is, uh, uh, so on the left, the parameter, parameter space, on the right, the space of prediction functions. And a last video uh, comparing like uh, the kernel regime where you have smooth functions and the feature learning regime when you have like non smooth functions. So same problem. Okay, so on the left, L2, where you learn the smoothest function, which is like separating the data. Whereas on the right, you see uh, uh, what you obtain with uh, learning, uh, uh, with uh, neural network learning, with all parameters being optimized upon. So you only get like a small number of neurons. So you learn the good direction, which are important, and you get a, 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 like a less smooth function. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so a very small. Uh, almost the last slide. So this is the, um, this is just to highlight the fact that uh, when you do this, like learning the two layers, you do get better results. Okay, so here I'm taking a very basic problem we have uh, in the R of dimension 15, D of dimension 15, and I'm assuming all the signal is on the first two coordinates. And this is how the first two coordinates look like. Okay, well separable. And I add noise in the other coordinates. Okay, so I know that the optimal prediction will be only on two variables. Okay, and I'm testing uh, optimizing over the two layers in blue. Okay, and you can adapt and see and, uh, and uh, identify those uh, two dimensions and uh, do well in test error as you get more points. Whereas if you don't try to uh, learn the, the, the input weights, you just optimize the output weights, you do, you do much worse. Okay, so to conclude uh, in this talk, I provided a qualitative analysis 
of gradient descent for the two layer neural networks. Okay, there was one result was it converged globally if you have infinitely many neurons. And uh, uh, if you use it in the context of uh, binary classification, you converge to places which are well defined and for which we can prove that we can generalize. Big issue is only qualitative. Okay, I have not been able to uh, to uh, give you any bound on m and t, m being the number of neurons that you need to achieve this limit, and t is in the time it takes. Okay, so this is like a big open problem at the moment. Other like uh, open problems, how do you extend this to like uh, convolutional neural networks? Okay, so this is uh, difficult and uh, also deep. Okay, so at the moment, um, very shallow at the moment. I've just had like a single hidden layer and clearly this is like one of the big open problems in the field. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. Uh, we have uh, we have time for questions, yeah. So, uh, if somebody wants, I, I see one question in the chat uh, from uh, Ignacio. He said, uh, I think it's about the first part, right? Uh, how may the entropy of the particles influence the convergence guarantees? Can you repeat? Okay. Uh, uh, the question is, how may the entropy of the particles? influence the conver convergence guarantees. Entropy of the particle, or you mean the entropy of the distribution, which you would- I guess, to... yeah, in the, in the initial distribution, I guess, right? Yeah, uh, oh, I think, okay, so clearly, uh, the more uniform, the better. Okay, so there's an entropy uh, there. So th that's a good question. Uh, I, I don't see any direct influence. Uh, uh, Except that, at least, is a way when you prove the result, we need some diversity. Okay, so yeah, no, I, I couldn't, and I don't have the answer to that one. So. I, I, I had also one question about uh, so so the results are uh, obtained with um, gradient flows. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if, if there's an intuition about uh, how the uh, how using a, a, a gradient step. I mean, a, a oh, I think the uh, I think it should be possible. I think the the, the, the argument at the end ended up being quite simple it, with, with a gradient flow that you can show in the Wasserstein case that if you start with the density. You always have a density through along, uh, throughout the gradient flow. Okay, so you keep a bit of mass everywhere. With uh, gradient descent, uh, it's a bit more difficult because you could lose mass a bit. And uh, I think then, if you have a small step size, maybe you could show things, but then you're cheating because you go back to the gradient flow. But we are, I think. Okay. I think this is now. This is interesting, but also interesting, but the. It's a matter of what do you want from theory? You want theory to take the exact algorithm that you use and prove that it works. Uh, prefer this one, okay? But here we are, we are abstracting. We are like already like in a very simplified setup. And I, with these neural networks, I tend to believe more and more on what is the idealistic setup on which you can show non-trivial results and for which the behavior mimic what you do in practice. Yeah, I, this is the only thing I can provide at the moment. I would prefer the exact like matching between theory and practice. At the moment, like making the things ideal, we are more in that stage where uh, let's make things as simple as possible. And there it's already difficult. But that's a yeah. good point. Uh, yeah, to understand the intuition. I mean, I mean how it, how it works first. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I don't agree with that. I, I, and about the, the, the extension that, that you mentioned at the end, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, you have a feeling about, um, for, for example, if you, if, you, if you add depth, uh, how, how the, the, the no, minerals... If you add the, the idea of what you can do, okay, what people have done, you can define a mean field limit when the width of the two layers of like multiple layers go to infinity. This you can do. 
but then you get a set of coupled PDEs, which you can define, but it's very hard to analyze them and to get any intuition from the resulting PDE. So here, the, what, what works, so I've not shown the PDE, not, I don't want to scare people away. There's a PDE, okay? There's a classical like PDE from optimal transport. Okay, so DTMU is whatever from divergence and, uh, and things like this. And so but that PDE provides insight and can help us show what we want. The PDE with more than one layer is like, even defining it takes a few lines, so. Okay. I have a question. Uh, regarding with the main theorem of the first part of the talk, mm -hmm. I remember if I remember and understanding correctly the paper, one of the main assumptions is that the measure converges. In order oh, to la, la, very good. So I have an expert there. Yes, yeah, so this is why. Uh, very good. Very good question. Yeah, so did you have a question or do you want just to highlight this? Uh, not only to highlight, is there any way to get around this problem or yeah. is a way to uh, assure that the measure is converging? Yeah, so I, th I think, uh, I think, so here the informal theorem as stated is incorrect. Okay, so the proper uh, informal way is if the gradient flow converges, it can only be to a, a global optimum. Okay, the reason being that we were not able to prove that the gradient flow converges. Okay, so for some, it's not a big deal. Okay, uh, but it is a reasonable deal. And so the way to prove that uh, gradient flow is converging in uh, Euclidean spaces is to have some Lozadevit conditions. Okay, so this is the way that I know. And the issue, and you can show that most functions that you can think of in the uh, finite spaces will satisfy such Lozadevit conditions. Okay? But in infinite dimensions, like for the vast search time gradient flow, it's not true. And we have tried, or we have tried for a few months to find like sufficient conditions under which everything was behaving correctly, but we couldn't, okay? And this, this is difficult. And partly because uh, uh, we want to apply this to non-differentiable functions. Okay, so this is, now this is like, uh, we've tried and, uh, uh, and we tried again recently during like a lockdown. So we thought the lockdown would allow us to give us time to look at this, but this was even worse, lockdown plus frustration of not being able to solve the problem. So, but we tried, but uh, we couldn't find it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Johan, Johan has a question, right? You, yes. Well, actually, yes, if you want, I, I tell it. it's actually about the, the second part uh, about the results yeah. uh, for the random feature kernel regime. Mm -hmm. So the first one, yes. Um, you obtain conversions. Yes, the, 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 yes, ex, no, yes, no, uh, again, back, back, back. Yes, 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 that one. So at the end, you says you, you, you have convergence to, you give an expression mm -hmm. that eta, does it has an, a meaning and interpretation in the data space? No, oh, no, so, so here the, uh, the eta here, it's yeah. just, it's just the, the distribution of theta, okay, of theta one. Okay, so because you initialize the uh, neurons randomly, okay, you apply the law of large numbers, so you convert to the expectation. So eta is distributed like the random neurons. Okay, so this is just defi the, the definition of eta. In okay. terms of meaning, no, it's just like you do random predictions of your data. Okay, so what this is doing is you take random projections of your, random projections of your data and threshold them, and you get a big set of features of uh, of numbers and you do the, you do the least squares or linear regression on it, but there is no no there is no there is no uh, there is no uh, uh, interpretation and even Absolutely. worse if you look at in in, in the uh, it's you're going to average over many uh, theta like this okay at the end you lose any form of uh, identity of every neuron okay this is the average behavior which which you can which you characterize. And having the end to norm penalty will push you to consider the average behavior of, of neurons. So you lose individual neurons. Whereas with the L1 norm, you're going to access neurons. You can access neurons one by one. 
and now they have a meaning because there's all other projections. So if you look at my mm -hmm. video here, at the uh, theta one, this is the direction. This is one of the directions that is being learned. Okay, so you learn the directions, the local directions which are separating the data. Okay, so okay. Uh, that was for the kernel here in those smooth curves. So those smooth curves are obtained by averaging over many, uh, many different directions, but the, di the individual directions are meaningless. Okay, thanks. We have uh, more questions? <coughs> no? Okay, so uh, I think that, 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 that will be all. Uh, thank you very much again, uh, Francis. <laughs> Uh, for for this talk, um, mm -hmm. next week we have another talk uh, on on machine learning, but on, on the uh, I mean uh, on the SVM uh, on the SVM side, uh, more on the SVM side, yeah. Uh, for for those uh, for those who are connected, mm -hmm. um, so. Thank you, thank you much again. Thank you uh, all of all of you for uh, being uh, with us. Um, thank you.